Hey guys, welcome back to Jessen Reads Romance. I'm Jessen and today I'm finally here with my September wrap up. September was actually a pretty good month. I read quite a few books, more than I thought that I would be able to, and um, I'm throwing in a new kind of like stat comparison where I compare my TBR to what I actually read. <laughs> and I did better than I thought, so I think that September went pretty well, but let's get started. I read 39 books for the month of September and I had one DNF, so one book that I started and I didn't finish. Six of them were rereads, which is a little bit higher than normal. I mean, normally I'll have um, around three to four rereads for the podcast. And um, I did decide to dip into Nalini Singh, which is one of my favorite authors to reread. I really love her Side Changeling series. I think that they're extremely rereadable and it's just like a comfort read to me. So I needed a couple pick-me-ups. So two of those rereads were Nalini Singh. She's just phenomenal. I love I love it. It's like my in case of emergency if I'm really feeling like in a book slump or down or just need something like quick and easy to read that I absolutely know that I'll love. It's going to be Nalini Singh Side Changeling series. Okay, so for the TBR comparison, I went back to my September TBR video and I counted out the books that I had on there, which was 19 books. And I read 14 of the 19, which is pretty darn good. I thought, I for some reason, I was thinking that I completely went off the rails with my TBR, but I think it was just because the amount of books that I read compared to the amount that I put on my TBR, because I did mood read 26 books. So, I mean, this is totally indicative of how much my reading depends on my mood. If I'm not feeling a book, I'm going way off the rails. I'm not following my TBR. I'm just grabbing something completely random. And that's just the way that it goes sometimes. And one of the things that I did during the month of September, I did a Rockstar reading vlog. So I read quite a few good books on the Rockstar reading vlog, which was pretty surprising. It's not one of the subgenres that I normally gravitate towards, but um, I discovered a new author, Gabrielle Sands, and this was her debut novel. And I really did like it. And it was a reverse harem female rock star book, and I loved it. I also read a Peter Pan retelling where Hook was the hero and he's like an anti-hero and stuff, which was really great. And I also went off the rails and read some serial killer romances, which I'll talk about in my favorite section. September is kind of spooky season for me too. So I started gravitating towards monster romances because it is a thing that I like to read. I like alien romances, I like monster romances. So all of those things were just kind of calling to me and I just followed that. And of course I had Elisa Braden on my TBR. I actually only put like one book, like I would at least read one book by Elisa Braden during the month of September, but I ended up by finishing her entire Rescued from Ruin series, which was amazing and it kind of made the month of September amazing. So indie versus traditional, as always, independent is just far outpacing traditional for me. That's what I normally gravitate towards. So 29 of the books that I read were independently published and 11 were traditionally published. And actually the books that were traditionally published were mostly Nalini Singh or historical romance. So like Avon, makes up a lot of my traditionally published books if I'm reading historical romance. And then if we break it down by genre, I read still majority contemporary romance, 23 books. Then historical comes in at second place with nine books. So good month for historical. Thank you, Elisa Braden. Four paranormals, one fantasy, three urban fantasies, zero sci-fis. I only read one arc out of three that I needed to read for the month of September. I feel really bad about that. Um, arcs right now are just feeling like assigned reading. I completely stopped requesting arcs. So as soon as the month of October finishes, I don't think I have any arcs. Oh, I might have one in December and that's it. Like I have no more arcs after that. 21 of the books that I read were audiobooks. It's just how I am able to continue to read now that I'm in school and it's very, very busy. Most of the audiobooks that I read are while I'm working so that I can listen to it while I work because the afternoons when I'm off of work, that's dedicated to studying. So it's no wonder why I read so many audiobooks. And the paperback, I believe, was The Legacy. That's what I read in paperback. I really just don't have time to sit down at night and read. <laughs> All right, now let's break it down for ratings. I had a pretty good month. Like I said, the feel like the month of September was just filled with a lot of books that I really truly loved. I had 12 five stars, seven 4.5 stars, and 12 four stars. So those are like top tier books and that's a lot. That makes up the majority of the books that I read, that I read. And two 3.5 stars, three three stars, two 2.5 stars, one two star, one DNF. So I did have an interesting amount of like 2.5s, twos, and DNFs because normally it takes a special book to kind of get below the three star range. That means that I just couldn't stop thinking about how much this book bothered me. <laughs> 
<laughs> and yeah, so we had a couple of those. Now let's go talk about my favorites and my least favorites. Let's start off with my favorites, which we have to start off with Elisa Braden. Anything But a Gentleman was such a phenomenal book. This is book seven. I think it's book seven in the Rescued from Ruin series. And the heroine Augusta is the daughter of a baron who was impoverished. And now she and her sister are alone in the world. They're like orphans. And Augusta is the oldest sister. And she needs to force her sister's suitor to marry her. He's giving them a hard time. And she knows that her sister's suitor has some debt that was accumulating at this guy Reaver's gaming hell. And so she decides to sneak into Reaver's gaming hell and she disguises herself as like a maid and everything to try to get to Reaver and convince him that I need this guy's marks so that I just trust me, like I'll play you for them. I'll do anything. Like what do you want in exchange for these marks? And I just loved Augusta's character so much. She was such a go-getter. She was literally doing anything that she could to ensure that her sister had a phenomenal life. And then Reaver is just like, who is this woman who's breaking into my club? Like, like she keeps showing up in my office even though the staff know like don't let her in like no girls allowed first of all and she just keeps showing up and so he's a little bit intrigued like she is resourceful she's savvy and she's here to bargain with me like nobody bargains with me so it's just it was such a phenomenal romance it was like a chess game like who's gonna come out on top and they start falling in love in the process and it was just it was beautiful and it was one of my favorite books in the Rescued from Ruin series, so I just love them. I just love them. Then, in anticipation of the release of Saint by Sierra Simone, I read Sinner because I had not read Sinner. I read Priest year before last. I think it was a year before last. I read Priest for the first time. I always meant to go back into the series after I read Priest and Midnight Mass and I just never picked up for Sinner for some reason. And oh my god, I'm so glad that I finally decided to pick up Sinner. You don't have to read it to understand Saint. It's just all siblings. All the books are about siblings, but Sinner was phenomenal. I listened to the audiobook of this one and I was like entranced. Sean and Zinni are so freaking hot. So this is an age gap romance and a brother's, a best friend's little sister romance. So Sean has been knowing Zinni's older brother for a long time and he hasn't seen Zinni in a while. They have a chance meeting where he doesn't recognize her and he's very attracted to her. And she's actually kind of having like a last two raw because she plans on becoming a nun. And it's a process, you don't just automatically become a nun and boom, you, took, you take your vows. And especially since Zinni is like so young, they want her to make sure. So like make sure that you want to start this process and stuff. And since she and Sean kind of hit it off on that chance encounter, she decides to ask him to kind of teach her what she's gonna be missing out on. Like she wants to experience life, she wants to experience sex. So like what better way, teach me. And I love that, I love it so much. It was freaking hot, it was phenomenal. It wrapped up in the most beautiful way. It was just very satisfying. So that was a, an amazing read. Then let's talk about my Psycho Boys. I read Unhinged and Psycho, and this is a new to me author, Onley James. She writes MM Romance. I, can't, I don't know what else to say besides these books are so heartwarming and they're about serial killers. It's just, it's crazy the way that Onley James writes her characters because it is kind of insta-lovey, but it absolutely works for the situation. The way that the Mulvaney brothers were raised, the, the situation that they were in. So there was this doctor, Dr. Thomas. He wants to kind of conduct an experiment with boys who had experienced like trauma and were showing psychopathic tendencies. And his experiment was if I adopt these boys and I hone their innate desire to kind of manipulate and that desire to kill, if I hone all that kind of like Dexter to only kill bad guys, like what would happen? Can I make them productive members of society and they're just going to help bring criminals to justice who are like escaping the system, who are like flying under the radar and they can't be jailed and stuff. And so that's what he does. And so all of these brothers are adopted. The first book is about Adam and he is actually a model and he gets confronted by one of his previous kills sons so he murdered this guy's father and noah walks in and disrupts this murder but i mean his dad dies and uh adam runs away and adam was only 16 at the time and i think noah was about 10 and then years later noah comes find adam and be like i know what you did i know who you are you're a serial killer and then the obsession starts adam starts getting obsessed with noah and it just it freaking works. Their relationship is beautiful. Then we have Psycho. <laughs> I love Psycho. So August is an extremely smart guy. He's a professor at a university and I think he does 
some type of physics. Oh my God, I totally blanked on that, but he is extremely smart, okay? And then there's this adjunct professor who is going to come teach like criminal psychology or something, and his name is Lucas. He's a former FBI agent, and there was something that happened, like Lucas has like a mark against his name because he kind of had like a breakdown. And Lucas is psychic, so he can kind of touch somebody and know that they've done bad things or he can touch like objects and stuff that has like an imprint. And that's how he was helping the FBI, but everyone just thought he had good intuition until he accused one of his fellow agents that, oh my gosh, this guy's a murderer. Everybody's like, wow, you're having a breakdown, threw him in a psychiatric ward and everything. And so they're like, you're gonna need to take a leave of absence. So now he's in education for a little while and he literally runs into August. And like I said, when he touches things, he can feel it. So he runs into August and he's like, oh my God. And he's just like, wow, I ran into another serial killer. How How is this, you know, cardigan wearing professor? Like he's masquerading as this normal guy, but he is absolutely not. And I love how August just confronts him right away. He's just like, okay, so I heard that you're psychic. So the, your reaction that you just had, like, I don't believe in that type of stuff, but your reaction leads me to believe that you know what I am. And he's like, what? And he's like, yeah, I know you know. <laughs> and it just starts off like that. And again, these Mulvaney brothers know no personal bounds. So there's stalking and stuff. It's just, it's good. It's freaking good. If you have not read these, what are you waiting for? I cannot wait for the next book. And then for some new releases, the final book in this series by Devaney Perry, which is now being recovered, is actually the books available on Amazon now are the new cover designs because she changed the series title and also the title of the first book. I absolutely love the skull designs of these. These were designed by Hangley, which is an extremely popular romance cover designer. And they're beautiful, but she wanted to redo the covers last minute. Hang Lee was too busy to like adjust the covers. And so she just decided to go with another cover artist that she worked with and did a whole just new set. I'm glad that I have the original ones because I love skulls. I'm kind of obsessed with them. And I like these dark covers. Anyway, Tin Queen was awesome. Like this is how you end a series. And I was just so satisfied by the end of this. This is such an interesting setup to a romance. So the heroine Nova is the daughter of the president of this rival MC club. And our heroes are part, they were former MC members, but they've disbanded for years now, but they still get pulled into this drama with this awful club. And Nova wants revenge because they put her father in jail. So she kind of goes undercover and she's trying to find out information to take them down. So she has a chance encounter with Emmett and her plan is to basically sleep with him so that he'll allow her in his house and she can hopefully get into his laptop and stuff. But the thing is, she slowly starts to fall for Emmett and so now she has a conflict of interest. She doesn't want to hurt Emmett, but her father, who kind of is emotionally manipulating her, she feels like she can't betray his fa her father. And she always wanted to be like a part of his world. She's a girl, so of course she can't be in the motorcycle club because it's very, you know, misogynistic that way. So I just loved it. I love the way that this played out because there's betrayal, there's intrigue, but there's really beautiful, soft moments. I think that Devaney Perry is so good at writing the small, intimate moments of life that kind of make that relationship so believable. And I just, I can tell that these characters are truly in love and it's not just a lust thing. Even though they start banging pretty early on, it's just, it's beautiful. I loved it. I thought it was a phenomenal end to the series. Wow, my light is just going away. <laughs> What is happening? Today's pretty cloudy, so like the light's probably going in and out. But the final book that I really loved and it was a new release was The Lie by Carla Sorensen. So she has a couple of spinoffs. She has her original Washington Wolf series set in Seattle. And then she did The Ward Sisters, which was a spinoff from the final book in that series. And people just love, including me, the Washington Wolf like family so much that she said that she was going to just continue writing in this world. And so this is the first book. I don't think that the series has a title yet. And I'm pretty sure that the Ward sister was like an informal series title, not like the official one, but I loved the lie. Faith is the daughter of one of the couples from the original Washington Wolf series. And she's working in like the nonprofit organization that's attached to the Washington Wolves. The Washington Wolves football team 
and Dominic is a new trade and he has a bad reputation. A lot of it has to do with the team that he came from, but he has a chip on his shoulder and he feels like he has to always be defensive and stuff. And so he doesn't make quite the best impression when he finally gets traded to the Washington Wolf series. There was an incident and he was actually being a guy and taking the blame for something that a rookie did because he already had the bad reputation, so why not just take the fall and let the rookie have a clean slate so that that by that one action, we know that he's a good guy at heart. But then he has to put on this like whole badass face when he gets called into the office and the team owner is actually a woman. It's Faith's stepmom. And she's like, okay, so I'm gonna give you another chance, but what I need you to do is work with our nonprofit. I need you to show me that you're gonna try and you're gonna be under the direction of my daughter, Faith. Faith's gonna direct you and tell you what you need to do. So he automatically looks at Faith and he's just like, oh, this princess, this daughter of basically team royalty who has this managerial job in the nonprofit organization. She didn't really work to get where she's at. So he already has a chip on his shoulder about that because he has struggled. He has struggled to get where he is. So they don't have a great first meeting, but I love the way that Faith handles him. She's just like, I'm not afraid of you and you can bluster all you want to me, but you're still gonna do what I need you to do. So I really love that. They kind of like butt heads. She gets a lot of insight into maybe, maybe there's more than meets the eye with this guy, Dominic, who has a horrible reputation. And then there's an added layer to the story, okay? Both of these two characters have experienced loss because Faith lost her mother whenever she was very young. She was three or four, I think at the time and Dominic lost his sister. So they've had these pen pals for about five years that they have been talking to and they're best friends with these pen pals, with their pen pals. They're, they're each other's pen pals. They don't know it, they don't know it. But Dominic does figure it out. And so that becomes part of the issue because he's like, oh my God, this is my best friend. And I kind of treated her like crap when I met her in person not knowing that this was my best friend. They have like names, her screen name is like Turbo and that's what her dad calls her. And he figures it out because she says like this non curse word and he's like, I've only, I've only heard Turbo use that name before. So he does like a little test and yeah, it's just, oh, it's so good, it's so good. So that's what the lie is about and I loved it so much. I just wanna hug these characters so much. They were phenomenal. Okay, so now let's move on to my least favorite books. So let's start with my DNF, which was Groupie by C.M. Stunick. And this doesn't mean exactly that it's my least favorite because I barely got into it, but there was something about the writing style that really turned me off. I very much did not like being in the heroine's head. It was a weird place. She's going through a lot of stuff. Uh, her father just recently passed away and it just felt like she was not a coherent heroine to be in the mind of during this time. She ends up at this rock concert and happenstance brings her to this like VIP section because she's like the winner of like the scavenger hunt. If you win the scavenger hunt, then you get this VIP pass and she unknowingly wins it. And so she's like grieving, she's contemplating suicide. Then she's getting super drunk, trying to find a cigarette. Cause she's like, I've never smoked before. Like she's just accepting drinks from random strangers. It's just such a weird, Thing that's going on and she keeps running into the band members of this rock group but she doesn't know that they're they're the band members it's just all very coincidental and i think that the author does a lot of heavy lifting with this like ominous foreshadowing she's like oh what i didn't know is that they will change my life forever type of thing and i hate that type of stuff i'm just like just tell me the story i don't need to know that it's going to end in tragedy you don't have to keep reminding me every single chapter that it's not what it seems these guys are going to be super important later on in my life or like in a couple months or whatever and oh if i only knew i wouldn't have stepped onto that bus type of thing i hate that type of stuff so i was just like i can't do this and I stopped the audio. <laughs> and I was really excited to read this from my Rockstar Romance. It was one of the books that I was most excited about, so it really was disappointing when I just was like, this isn't for me. This writing style isn't for me, so I don't think I'll ever pick up another CM Stunic. I mean, I hate to say never, but it just doesn't feel like me and this author will mesh well together. One of my least favorite books <laughs> that I read in September was by Senai Rise by Cor Riley. And unfortunately, so Cor Riley, I've done like a video on Cora Riley's Born in Blood series. It was one of the first mafia romances that I picked up that kind of really intrigued me. Her Kimura Chronicles are, the first three books in the Kimura Chronicles are probably the only books by Cora Riley that I think are like, I still stand by them, like I love them a lot. Twisted Loyalties, Twisted Pride, um, Twisted Emotions, all three of those books are just so good. 
the last two, about the last two brothers, kind of crash and burn for me. And then we have By Sin I Rise, which is a spinoff from both Her Born in Blood and Kamora Chronicles. It's like the next gen series. It just was bad. It was just bad. The writing wasn't good. The characters really weren't good. I, If I had to pick, Marcella definitely was the better character. She's a mafia princess and she's doing all that she can to survive whenever she is captured um, and treated horribly by this motorcycle club who wants revenge against her father. The hero, Maddox, he has like this nickname, like Maddox Mad Dog, and he didn't even live up to that nickname at all. It was just, he felt so bland and it was just, it was just not a good experience for me. And I really don't want to pick up part two because this was only part one of the romance and I don't care. I don't care about these characters. So I'm really worried because at first I was cautiously optimistic. I was really excited to see the next gen. There was characters that I for sure was looking forward to, especially Ramo and Serafina's kids, Greta. I want to read Greta's story, but now I don't. Okay, I used to want to read Greta's story, but now I don't because she's going to be paired with Amo and we see Amo in this book. No, I don't know what happened to that. I just can't see Greta with him. It's just this, ooh, I don't know if I'll pick up another Core Riley is what I'm saying. She had some really good books that I love. The majority of her books were okay for me and now the most recent ones, I don't know where she is in like mentally while she's writing these books. I don't know what she has planned if her writing has just changed. She has new inspiration that's just not working for me. I have no idea, but it's just not, it's just not. So yeah, that book was 2.5 stars being generous, generous just because I, kind of liked Marcella. Another thing, sorry, another thing that I didn't love, Luca VTLO is supposed to be like one of the most fearsome mafioso guys and he did nothing. His daughter was captured under his nose by this rival MC group and Luca was like, had his hands tied the whole time. He did nothing. I wanted him to burn the entire world looking for his daughter and that didn't happen. I was very disappointed in Luca. And he's not even one of my favorite characters in the series, but I was just expecting a lot more from this, like, oh my God, everyone's afraid of him. Like he didn't do anything anyway. Then I read Pretty Words, which is actually um, the second book in this series by Gabrielle Sands. I really love Taut Strings. It's a reverse harem romance. Pretty Words is not a reverse harem. It's just an MF romance. And I feel like I have a suspicion that maybe she actually wrote Pretty Words first, maybe? It actually happens timeline wise. It happens before taut strings. I did not like this. It was just not an enjoyable. It was pretty angsty. The heroine is naive. She went on tour with her brother. She was only 17 and she has an encounter with Jamie, who is our hero and he's just spiraling. He's with another band who's touring with them. He's spiraling and he kind of is in the background for the first half of the book. They do have an incident incidents where Jamie actually kisses her and she's like too shocked to do anything. Her brother like freaks out about it and Jamie's just like, oh my God, I'm so stoned type of thing. Then his bandmate, Jamie, he has a bandmate named Oliver who is a predatory type of character. He's a predatory man looking for a naive girl to manipulate and he zones in on our heroine Ivy. And Ivy is just like, oh my God, he's so beautiful. He's an Adonis. I can't believe that he's paying attention to me type of thing. So she gets wrapped up into this weird relationship that is extremely toxic with this manipulative man and she thinks that this is love and it impacts her for years, for years. And so like I was dying inside that half of this book was her being taken in by Oliver. It's a real thing, but like she was so naive. She wasn't an enjoyable heroine to me. And then two years later, she's still obsessing over Oliver who just like wasn't good to her at all. They didn't even really date and he was just not a good guy. Jamie shows up. He's been sober for those two years and he is taking his steps in his program. He wants to apologize to Ivy for kissing her and she is so offended because she's like, that's not what you should be apologizing to me about. You should be apologizing because you ruined my relationship with Oliver. And he's like, Oliver, you don't even know him. This guy's horrible he's manipulative and she like doesn't want to hear it because oliver is the shit and jamie is the piece of crap that oliver always talked bad about and this is a romance between ivy and jamie <laughs> so it was just a very frustrating read for me i did not enjoy it at all i was very mad at the end of it and i couldn't stop 
thinking about how mad I was. Then I read The Lady and the Orc, my only fantasy, my only monster romance for the month of September. I heard a lot about this series. I did hear that the first book was not the best, but I still, I wanted to get into the series and I thought, you have to start at the beginning, right? The characters were not the greatest, but I was really invested in the story. But there was something that happened in the end where a character made a choice that I feel like was unforgivable. And I was just like, no, it didn't have to go this way, but you made this choice. I just didn't believe the HEA at the end. It was so unbelievable. I was like, I would never trust this person again. Yeah, so, mm. Didn't like that one. I heard that the rest are better. I just don't know if I'll ever pick up another one. Then we have The Devil's Own Duke. Ironically, the only arc that I read during the month of September. This is the second book in Lenora Bell's Wallflowers vs. Rogue series. I just feel like this book didn't have a lot going for it. The chemistry between the characters was extremely lacking. I felt like Lenora Bell was trying too hard to bring, to have our characters be concerned with like issues that would appeal to like a modern day audience, which I've read plenty of historical romances, like old, older historical romances that have like a hero or heroine that's um, altruistic and trying to help society, trying to help the needy or whatever. But the way that it was incorporated in the story, the way that Ash's plan of basically pretending to be the heir to this dukedom in order to help boys who are working in factories and stuff. It just didn't feel organic to the story. And then also Hetty's character, she's obsessed with winemaking and that just felt a little cheesy to me. So I just did not like this book at all. I thought it especially didn't work with the chemistry between the characters. That was its real big downfall was like, I don't like the story, but the bigger thing is that I don't believe that these characters are in love or attracted to each other. Like I just don't believe them together. So that was very disappointing. I gave that one three stars. And then lastly, The Obsession. I did not like this one at all. I was very disappointed. I know that this is a series that, you know, it's kind of questions like morality of the situation and stuff, but I just feel like the main hero and heroine who are gonna have the HEA together, I just didn't think that they had enough page time together because she was, the heroine was embroiled in this mind game with another character. I'm being vague because I don't want to spoil it for people who have not read um, the Filthy Rich Americans series or whatever. Mm -mm. I don't like the character that was messing with her mind and I don't like the heroine, Marist. She did some stuff that I was just like, it feels like cheating to me. I'm gonna cut off that series with the obsession. I'm no longer gonna read the rest of the series. All right, so that is it. <laughs> That's it for my September wrap up. I'm glad that I finally got a chance to sit down and actually talk about these books because honestly, there were just so many good ones that I read. So despite the ones that really disappointed me that were like the really low stars, when I think about the books that I read during September, like there's just too many good ones to think about. So I don't even worry about the bad ones. <laughs> I'm already forgetting about them. All right, guys, if you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe to get notified in any future videos that I do. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, life's better with a little HEA. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.